this way. So Diane, that means that you go first. How are you? I'm just fine. Having relatively nice weather. It's been back and forth here in Michigan, where it'll be in the 70s for a while. And then today it's kind of hot and sticky. So Right. So you're on the east side of the lake. I grew up on the west side of the lake where when the wind changed, the temperature could drop an easy 50 degrees in like two hours. No, we do not have that. <laughs> Lucky you. And, you know, you do spend part of the year here in Scottsdale. So you're coming back, am I right, sometime in September? That's exactly right. That's, I'll be there probably about the 15th. Wonderful. Well, it'll be great to see you again. So Stephanie, I haven't had a chance to meet you before. Tell us where you are and you know, how's the weather and all that good stuff? I'm in Houston and the weather for in Houston summer is really never any good. It's super hot and muggy. So just trying to get through it. Yeah, no, I know Houston is basically, well, what not it called the Bayou City, which sort of means it's a swamp? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Definitely. Right. It feels like it too. So just as hot as Scottsdale, but with the additional benefit of humidity and mosquitoes. Well, we don't usually get to into the hundreds, so um, that's at least a benefit. But yeah, the, the humidity is rough. Yeah, well, come on. I grew up in Chicago where when it was 90 degrees and raining, it was much hotter than it ever is in Phoenix when oh, it's okay. 105 and we have 8% humidity. So <laughs> I don't buy that. However, we've had a very strange summer since we're talking about weather here for a minute, where we've had quite a lot of rain and floods. Um, not anything like the horrible scale that they've experienced in Germany and Belgium and even part of Holland, but for Phoenix, really a lot of water. So there we are. How about you, Claire? Where are you? Um, I'm in Iowa and I'm, I really, I can relate to what you're coming about Chicago is the other day we, I think it was 88 degrees, but the feels like temperature was 105. So because of the humidity and the, yeah, but, um, but. I just got a, uh, air conditioning in my house for the first, I live in a house that was built in 1890. So we just got air con, central air conditioning in my house two days ago for the first time. So I am loving this. <laughs> Happy dance all the way around. Oh, I remember when I was a child, my mother used to put up damp sheets and then blow a fan through them. And yeah. my grandfather bought one of the very first air conditioning car, conditioned cars. It was a big Cadillac. And it must have been in the very early 50s. And we would all pile in the car and drive around, you know, for no purpose other than just to be sitting here in the air conditioning. So we've all come a long way since. And this is particularly ironic since we're going to be talking about England. And we're going to be talking about not current England, so colder England. And um, because I'm reliably informed, they are actually planting vineyards in England at this point. You know, it's gotten so warm. And in fact, Martin Walker, who writes the wonderful Bruno Chief of Police stories, said that the first vineyard in Scotland has been planted. So that's a really scary thought if you think about, you know, climate change going up. Right. So um, I'm going to assume it's now four o'clock and we can talk about real things here instead of weather. So um, I am going to do this alphabetically for the moment. So I'm going to go back to Diane and ask her, here is her new book, A Fiance's Guide to First Wives and Murder. And right there in that title, First Wives and Murder and Fiance indicates something's really wrong. So uh, it's a Countess of Harley mystery. Is this the fourth one, Diane? It is number four. And this is where there's been a sort of change in title because the first three were slightly different. Yeah, the first three were A Lady's Guide. And um, for people who don't know, when you sell a book, you usually get a contract, if you're doing a series, to write a few. And nobody, not the publisher, not you, not your agent, nobody knows if that's going to continue. So when they bought book four, five, and six, um, the sales department came back and said, you cannot keep calling them a lady's guide to this and that. It, it just gets people confused. And, you know, I had no idea because there's purple book, pink book, blue book, and now yellow book. So it's, I don't know where the confusion is, but they said it was. So that was not a hill I was going to die on. I said, okay, that's fine. We'll come up with something. And these actually... The, the titles that we have for the next group are, are just like even a little more descriptive because now we've changed the noun as well. So 
this this particular book. Were you, did you ask me to say anything about this? Yes. No, I was going to ask you to carry on. I was just sort of easing into it. So do. <laughs> I got a little gabby for a moment. Um, this particular book, uh, Frances has finally married off her sister, and now she and George can announce their engagement. George Hazelton is her fiance and has been kind of her partner in crime for a few books, and or crime solving anyway. So now they're excited, they're planning an engagement party, they're making plans for their wedding, and the only thing that can stand between the two of them and a life of wedded bliss is his wife. His first who, wife. Right. His first wife, who shows up with Inspector Delaney almost on Francis's doorstep and claims to be related to the Grand Duke Michael Mikhailovich, to the, the Queen, to she plant, uh, claims to be George's wife, not his first wife, but his wife, his only wife, still married. And Francis thinks she's just delusional. There's something wrong with this woman. And when a couple of days later, when she is found dead in Francis's backyard, she and George are the prime suspects. So now they have to kind of wade through some of her crazy stories that she's told them to determine what's true, what's false, and what might lead them to the killer. So if this is a fiance's guide, are you anticipating a really long engagement as in, in two more books, or are you going to waltz up a different title? Uh, the next book will actually be a bride's guide to ah. marry the murder. Okay. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna postpone it very long at all. <laughs> Sorry, that was a spoiler. <laughs> I shouldn't have asked. <laughs> you could essentially have asked me what my next book is. So okay, I That's won't good. do that. So Stephanie, um, your guy, uh, your book, Olive Wright Pigeoneer, was your debut, or at least uh, it certainly was the start of a series, but was it your also your first novel? It was not my first novel. It was my first mystery. I had written a few uh, romantic novels under a pseudonym prior to Olive Bright Pigeoneer. But yes, this is my first mystery. Um, it, it is part of a series. And um, should I give you a short description? Sure. Uh, basically, it's set during World War II. And um, Olive is a um, veterinary student whose family has a loft of racing pigeons. And she is basically, she, because of the blitz, she kind of got pulled from school and is back in her home village. And she's looking for something to do for the war effort, something more significant, she thinks, than rolling bandages or knitting hats. So she's kind of um, hunting around when an opportunity presents itself for her to not only put herself to work, but also her pigeons with the, uh, an intelligence organization uh, working for the war. And shortly thereafter, a uh, body is found outside her family's pigeon loft. And so she's kind of pigeoneer sleuth all at once. She gets thrown into everything. Um, it's fascinating. I mean, there are so many different aspects to World War II and so many stories yeah. coming out, particularly stories of what women did in the war more than military aspects. And we'll come back to, you know, the how much real historical um, fact is in, is absorbed into the fiction or how much the fiction rests on real historical fact. I learned a lot from Stephanie's book, all of which truly <laughs> surprised me. So let's, yeah, it was great. So let's talk to Claire um, and tell us a little bit about Murder at Key Haven Castle. Yeah, so that's the um, third book in the series. It's about an American heiress, kind of like a million dollar princess, if you think uh, uh, Cora from, um, Downton Abbey, she was American uh, heiress. And there was a lot, during that era, there was, well, there's a lot of Americans who would go to Britain to um, get married off and in, infuse their funds into the British uh, society that was kind of floundering with a lot of um, debt at the time. And so her father kind of, in the first book, her father kind of, um, decides to sell her off. He is a Kentucky horse breeder and he kind of decides to sell her off like one of his prize horses to a Viscount so he can get into Mrs. Astor's ballroom in Newport. And she doesn't like that. And so the, the Stella is the main character and Lindy Viscount uh, Lindhurst is her fiance. And at first they don't really get it, get along very well. But the vicar ends up dying in that book and they have to kind of solve the murder and, and it, they kind of bond over it. 
So in this book, they actually, their wedding is actually eminent a few days off. And as with any wedding, um, family and friends from all over kind of descend on their manor house in Hampshire, which is, it's the book is, the series is set in the, like you said, the New Forest in uh, Hampshire. And some of those guests are not only uninvited, but they are completely not wanted. They're really unwelcome. And so you get a little bit more of um, some of the more of the American relatives show up. And then there's also some of the more Brit the British relatives show up. So there's a lot more backstory, a lot more. Um, you find out a lot more about the characters, where they kind of came from. And so they this book kind of involves um, horse racing scandals. And um, I even kind of pulled in a little bit of a American Wild West stories. And, and then eventually they kind of to get away from all this stuff that's going on before kind of wind down, you know, there's always a day or two before a wedding, you just kind of want to step away from the planning and kind of chill. And so they all go on this excursion to Key Haven Castle and uh, um, a murder occurs there that kind of turns both of their lives upside down and the wedding gets postponed again maybe and you'll have to read the book to find out <laughs> so okay so <laughs> what we know from all this is that Ava Vanderbilt who became Ava Belmont um who was the queen of Newport society if you go there you can go visit the Marble House and so forth but part of the impulse in the in the so-called um golden age um I'm trying to remember gilded age in New York sorry um was to marry off daughters for social advancement right. and um, willing grooms in England who had the upkeep of serious castles and estates and no money. So um, it, that's based on, on real life. Consuela Vanderbilt, um, Ava's daughter, was forced to marry um, the heir to the dukedom of Marlborough. It was not a happy marriage. It resulted in um, divorce eventually, but yep. the money <laughs> stayed there. Um, Winston Churchill's mother, Jenny Jerome, is another example of that. Yeah. Um, and, and of oh, course there great. were more, and then there were some, there were some people who, I mean, some women who voluntarily, um, yes. went to England and, and married into the aristocracy. It wasn't always that they were victims of their mothers. Um, right. but you know, in a way it's a really interesting book for the Me Too era, because really it was abusive. Um, you know, to, to have these girls, Consuela was more or less locked up and, you know, forced to, to marry. I'm trying to remember what his name was. I want to say George, but I don't think that was his oh, name. Oh, Marlborough is the Duke of Marlborough. Well, it was the heir. Yeah, but I, I'm trying to remember what his first. But it doesn't matter what his first name was. So, in that in that um, vein, uh, Diane, tell us about Frances, the Countess of Harley. Was hers a voluntary marriage or um, forced? No, it was voluntary, and and I think most of them actually were. Very few. Of the mothers of that era were like Alva Vanderbilt. She she was One hopes. <laughs> extremely controlling, and and both her children had the short end of that stick. But um, with, with Frances, what these women were were dealing with was they were newcomers to New York. They were new money. Their fathers were sometimes unsavory. In Frances's case, that wasn't it. Her father had been an inventor. And then he found out that what he really seemed to invent was money. Anything he touched just really did well. So he turned to the stock market. And um, she and her mother just couldn't get into New York society. And that was not uncommon. So Francis was stuck with the idea of, okay, well, maybe my dad will bring home some junior partner for me to marry. Or I could remain a spinster or I could take my chances across the Atlantic. And they were much more accepting. They were going through an agricultural um, depression during the last quarter of that century, and they really needed the influx. So that's what she did. Hers was voluntary, but she was 18, so she really didn't know too awful much about it, but she was taking a chance. And um, when these women did that, they, they, their parents turned over a huge dowry and then waved goodbye and went back to America because yes, they could get into Mrs. Astor's drawing room now. 
And they were left alone, hoping that this man and his family would treat them well. And in Frances's case, her husband pretty much just ignored her. He dropped her off at the country home and he went about his business. He just kept his bachelor ways and kind of ignored the fact that he had a wife. And then ultimately uh, the book, the first book opens, Frances is a widow and she's just gone through her first year of mourning. So he ultimately dies. So Stephanie, even though you're jumping up to World War II, rather than being in the Gilded Age, latter part of the 19th century, you still have a, um, a, a girl whose father can largely dictate what she does. It's hard for her to break you know, the bonds of family and even of class to do what she wants to do. Yes, um, that is actually a, a problem uh, for her. Um, and it, it, I don't want to, there are no spoilers because this happens right at the beginning of the novel. Uh, basically, when she's given the opportunity to, to be put to work for the war with, um, with her birds, the condition is that she has to do it without her, without telling her family, her friends, or specifically her father, because she's hoping, the whole family is hoping initially that the birds are going to be accepted into the, um, the National Pigeon Service, which is widespread used across the services basically you uh provide birds and then the army or, or the navy or whichever of the services they're in charge of what gets done with them so in the novel her father believes himself to know best and uh does not want to relinquish control he doesn't believe that these other um trainers or uh pigeoneers know what he knows that he thinks he could could do better so he, they don't want to work with him. So the, the National Pigeon Service is not willing to vet her birds. And so she's kind of floundering because if the birds are not being used for the war effort, then they're not going to, there's not going to be any pigeon feed because the feed is reserved for birds that are being used for the war effort. So then um, basically that's one of the main reasons she agrees to go along with the secret, keeping, keeping everything from her father, which is difficult, of course, because they're really his birds, but you gotta do what you, what you gotta do, I guess. But he's, he's generally, I think a good, a good father, but yeah, he's a little prickly, a little uh, bossy. He's not, he's really not forcing her into marriage. <laughs> it's an unconventional thing for a girl at that time to be doing. So I'm sure that that's part of it. So I was gonna ask you all what drew you to write um, about England as opposed to America. And you, you two, Claire and Diane, have kind of answered it. And one way you've worked out to do it is you've used an American as your viewpoint character. So you don't have to be really British, you know, um, in order to write it. But Stephanie, you know, you've chosen to write about a British family. What, why did you do that? I mean, what, what interested you? Was it the pigeons? Was it the war? What was it that drew you in? Well, both, actually both the Americans and British used pigeons. So I could have really gone either way, but I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to have it set in Britain, uh, the home front in Britain, because they were so much more really, it, it was so much more fraught. I mean, things were happening in Britain and, and they were really struggling and, and with all the, um, the food, was not being, was not coming in. There's all the victory gardens, the evacuations, the blitz and all that were really, they're kind of sitting pretty in America. So it wasn't, it wasn't as uh, intense of a, of a wartime uh, situation as it was in Britain. So that was really why I chose to have it set over there. Well, that makes really good sense. Claire, what appealed to you about the new forest? I mean, you could have, you could have worked this out for virtually any county in England. Yeah, I could have. Um, when I decided that horses were kind of going to be a, a continuing theme through the book, you know, her father is a, a Kentucky horse breeder and she's an accomplished horsewoman herself. Um, I actually was looking for some place in Britain that she would eventually um, feel comfortable in and kind of bond with because she was going to get stuck there. And when I found that New Forest is one of its, um, its you know values and one, one of the things that it's famous for is its um, free range new forest ponies that are endemic to the area and 
And then when I, you know, when I learned that it was kind of a, a unique area with with the, it's not being a forest, it's actually more of an open grassland, more, you know, um, area, but it just seemed a little bit like a place that would feel a little bit more like home for her. So that makes good sense. Plus, it has a kinder climate than if you'd gone to, say, Northumberland, <laughs> where, right. where it's pretty Absolutely. ghastly. So, Dan, in your case, most of the aristocracy had um, had homes, you know, townhomes, mansions, whatever you want to call them, in London. But most of them also had country estates. Um, you know, hence many of their titles are actually um, premised upon the geographical location of you know where their where their property is. So, you know, this book does take place in London and is centered on a on an interesting visit. And I, I like the fact that um, that you picked a real visit in time, 1899. But some of the things, um, and we'll get to this question later, happened earlier, but you decided, you know, you'd kind of mash it all up. Um, so London would be the logical place. Um, where else can you imagine that these stories would take place? Where have they taken place? Have they all been in London or, or have they been on the estate? They've been largely in London. Um, the first book starts when Frances leaves the family home because her husband has passed away and there's a new Earl of Harley and she doesn't really belong there. She kind of wants some independence. For Frances, um, yeah, like either a little cottage somewhere, which kind of isn't her style. She's always been a city girl or London. Uh, the thought for her of going home to her parents was uh, just... No, that, that was not a choice for her. It, it was certainly possible, but that would put her right back where she started. And she kind of was looking for some independence. So London was really her only option and she no longer has ties to a country home. Um, in the book, just be, book three takes place at George's uh, family seat, uh, he, his brother's home, his brother who is the Earl of Hartford. And um, they are out there having a, a shooting party and a, a house party. So I basically, because I have always wanted to go to a country house party, and I thought that would be lovely. So when Lily was getting married, I'm like, okay, you know what? We're gonna do this out in the country and we're gonna have a shooting party and we're gonna have archery and we're gonna have horse riding and we're gonna have all the tea parties and all, all that fun stuff. So, those so are I cool. actually have been to one. Um, I met okay. some people who had a wonderful estate. It was back in the 80s when I lived in England for a few months. And they had a wonderful estate in Lancashire and they were famous for raising pheasants. And they did have shooting parties, but by, by now, even in the 80s, they were really designed as economic engines. They were not you know, inviting the Prince of Wales and 14 of his friends to slaughter 2,000 pheasants. It was a money-making deal. And they were very kind and they invited me to have a gun and go out with the shooting party. And, and I realized how much money they were charging people, you know, to, to do that. And I, I just couldn't bring myself to, um, I didn't have that much cash at that point anyway. But aside from that, it, it was a, an amazing gesture. So I refused and I wandered around with the beaters, which was really fun because you get to ride in the vehicles and you get to drink and all that. And then they have this grand lunch when it's all over. So the only thing I didn't do was actually shoot the pheasants. And I've always been pleased that I did that. But, you know, it was a strangely Edwardian experience. But it's surprising how, what a business it has become. You know, I mean, you have to pay people, you have to raise the birds, you have to keep the property for the birds, you have to, you know, do all this other stuff. So what were gentlemen's pursuits at the time that you and Claire are writing has really turned into a business to a great degree, knocking some of the romance out. Yes, it was uh, fortunate the, the lab, because I haven't been able to get to England in a few years. So I was fortunate that the time that I did go, I got to visit on the end house. And um, that's what I modeled risings off of the, the state that George's family owns. Right. But, but I did not get to do any sort of uh, a shoot. But the person, uh, uh, someone modern in modern times, the person I did go to to get my information 
does that now. So he has done what you were talking about and gone on these shoots on these big estates and and he was able to explain to me exactly how that works. So that was fortunate. It's like, oh, well, right. that's what the British call proper jobs now, as opposed to, you know, um, because their staff has been so reduced. It used to be, you know, they would have um, dozens of gardeners on major estates and they would have gamekeepers and kennel keepers and horse keepers and the whole bit, which is economically more difficult now. So the tourist industry is to a great degree sustaining it. And, you know, it's, it's interesting. I, and I was thinking about your castle, Claire, that climate change is actually endangering some of these properties, particularly those on the water. There's a um, castle down on the channel that was, I think, built under Henry VIII, if I remember right, as a defense. And part of it's now crashed into the sea. Um, that is actually, it's Hearst Castle that yeah. you're thinking of. I and am. that's actually the castle that I modeled Keyhaven after. I yeah, and I was just going to say that. Yeah, the, the one part of the wall actually slid into the soul. Yeah. yeah, and, you know, over time, some of those chalk cliffs have crumbled and, you know, villages and so forth have fallen into the sea. So, yeah. Stephanie, you're, you're more inland. Where exactly, where exactly is Olive Bright? I, I say rural, but I'm being vague. Where is she? She's in a fictional village in Hertfordshire which is, okay. I mean, I, I really um, pattern it off of, it's, it's similar to, well, it, it is near where, uh, the Brickenden Mary Manor, where she's working with the intelligence group is an actual uh, manor house and was requisitioned for the war effort. So it's basically a fictional village right near there. And I sort of patterned um, Little Lamwell, her if you've heard of that. Um, it's about, I think- uh, I, know, I know where it is and it's oh, safe okay. inland. So, you know, yes, she's, yeah, she's not gonna yeah. crash into the ocean. Yeah. Right. So I, a question I'd like to ask all of you, and I think it's a really interesting one, is as historical novelists, as opposed to writing historical, non, you know, nonfiction and all, how much liberty do you feel able to take with actual events? And do you, do you change them somewhat to suit the plot of your book? So I know Diane does or did because she wrote that in the afterword for her book. So why don't we start with you? You tell us what really happened and why you changed it. Well, what really happened was that uh, the Grand Duke Michael Mikhailovich and uh, his wife visited uh, the Prince of Wales in November of 1899. I'm a little bit ahead of that now at what I'm writing. So I had to think back. And that kind of triggered something for me because I had a character. I don't know if everybody else does this, but occasionally you just, I have a character kind of in my back pocket and I'm just waiting for the right story to use them. And I thought this was the perfect place for that. And she's the one who ended up being Arena. With that, I, I know that there are certain Francis and George go to the ballet. So I know that there are some, some Russian operas, or I'm sorry, they go to the opera. And I found one and yes, it was performed. And one of the main actress was Fanny Moody and she didn't do it in 1899. I think she did it more like in 1879 or something like that. So yeah, things that actually happened, but not necessarily the then. Um, Alexei, the uh, father of my fictional uh, Irina Teske, he did take a world trip, uh, Grand Duke Alexei, to the US, but that was in the 70s, 1870s. And uh, I had him doing it at that time. So yeah, I think as long as you indicate that this is why I'm doing this, I think you can get away with it. It works with the plot. I. Don't, this is the first time I've used real people as characters. So this is the first time I've done that. Um, gosh, I don't know if I've ever played with anything in the other three books and the three previous books. Well, you did cover your ass nicely, you know, by putting in the actual dates and all. Maybe that's all that's really required. I know Tasha Alexander and I have had a fairly spirited discussion about this because She's writing a Lady Emily set in Egypt in Luxor um, before the Winter Palace, which is my favorite Victorian hotel. It's still standing about three years before it was built. And, you know, I said to her, relax, 
you know, just move it <laughs> a couple of years forward because it's perfect. And um, and she, I don't know whether she will or not, but I thought I think it's an interesting question, Claire. What what what's your position? Um, because you you're back there in the same time frame, roughly. Right, right. Um, I really try to keep as close as I can to um, historical fact. Um, I actually had them talking about um, Peter Pan, going to Peter Pan in London. And um, and I actually put in my author's note that Peter Pan actually came out six months earlier than what they said. But I think that's probably maybe the only thing that I did that in historical fact that I tweet. <laughs> um, usually in, in like you're talking about a, in like a hotel in Egypt or something, I think if I find that it's not there or there's something, then like in the case of that Hearst Castle, um, instead of using the actual castle, I renamed it and kind of fictionalized it because um, the actual castle that I based it on was a military installation that right. actually functioned until the 50s, until after, well after World War II. They still used it in World War II. So obviously tourists weren't wandering around in 1905. So I fictionalized it. And, and I think that's how I get around <laughs> the, the using the historical fact. And I, I tend, like Diane, I tend to shy away from using real people. One time I mentioned um, King Edward and, but he, he was at um, the, the Derby races and he would have been there, but of course he didn't meet my fictional characters, but he, he was there. And I try to use the horses that actually ran the race. And if I change the name, because I have one of my characters horses running the race, then I'll put it in my author's note and say, well, actually the real person, the real, I mean, the real person, the real horse that, you know, that placed in this race was named blank, you know, but I really tried to keep as close as I can to, to historical fact or an I author changed. Note, an author's note is a really useful thing. Um, you is. know, so that you it can is. try to word yourself off from the, there, there are a number of readers, particularly in mystery, who just can't resist um, pointing out um, yeah. either errors of fact or, you know, um, real history and so forth. It's, I, I've always thought that people I mean, certainly it's true for me, and I think for many people, read crime fiction to learn things, uh, you know, because it's a wonderful way to um, explore a lot of things and livelier than nonfiction. But then there are people who are really, I remember an historical novel, I've never forgotten this, it was written about some woman in the either 12th PC Doherty, who's written like 4,000 historical novels. Um, and anyway, she, she was spinning. And he actually got a note from somebody that said that the spindle he used was not right for 1170 or something. You know, I mean, you can take it to, to a serious extreme. Um, yeah. But I, I do think that if you have an author note where you say, okay, it really happened here, but you know, I moved it here, or it's really this, but I decided to call it that, it's kind yeah. of a good thing. But Stephanie, you have a slightly different problem because you're not that far removed. You're you're at right. least 50 years up in the, you know, closer. And in the events of World War II are so well known, you felt, I, I would imagine that you feel like you have to stick pretty closely to the actual facts. Yes, I, that's true. I, I do feel that, I mean, I want to obviously make it as authentic as possible. And um, one of the things that I really liked about um, writing this novel was that I thought, I mean, as far as I'm concerned, I've, I've read a good amount of um, World War II uh, books, fiction and nonfiction, and I feel like um, Brit the home front side of things isn't nearly as well covered as the uh, what was what was going on in occupied Europe. And so all the little things that the Women's Institute and the Girl Guides and all, all of those different groups did uh, for the war effort, I thought that was lesser covered and it would keep things a little bit lighter. And so I, I really tried to, to do my research on all of those different elements to make it really authentic. But also um, I, I, don't, I don't have a real person that's readily identifiable in Olive Bright. But um, as I mentioned, the, the manor house is, uh, is a real manor house and was requisitioned and it was used for the purpose that I, I am having it used 
in the novel. So I, I really was trying to make sure that things that I was having happen there could really have happened there. Uh, the only thing that I have no record of is that they might have had a pigeon ear at their disposal, but I'm, I figure they easily could have because I did find record and I mentioned this in an author's note of a of a woman in a, a different village who was raising pigeons for the same intelligence organization. So I figured they could easily have had one just there's just no records that I have found. So really that's my I think my main reach. Otherwise I think everything is historically possible and, and could could have been how it, how it actually was or is if I found if I did find documentation, so. One of the useful things about author notes is that you can not only do these, um, you know, check, check bags to, to real facts and so forth, but in Stephanie's book, the thing I loved about the author notes, there's a real hero pigeon. I had no idea that this pigeon, which actually earned a medal. Oh, there's a ton of them though. Well, There's, I know, but the one, I, I was really gripped by the one that you oh, told us about. So oh, tell us about his absolutely astonishing flight. I mean, it it reminds me so much of one of my favorite George Ed Hare novels. In fact, my very favorite George Ed Hare novel, which is called The Civil Contract. And at the end, when Adam has speculated on the on the change, um, as to, and, and it it's all about whether Napoleon or Wellington is gonna be victorious at Waterloo. And if it's Napoleon, he's going to lose everything. And if it's Wellington, he's going to be okay. And, you know, the, the message has to, has to come in. Um, and it made me think about your pigeon who flies this astonishing route in order to bring news of victory. I mean, just amazing. They don't, they, they are really, I mean, I, when I started um, thinking that I wanted to write a mystery, it came immediately into my head that I wanted there to be pigeons involved, which is super strange, but I think they've been in the back of my mind since I took my kids to see that Disney movie Valiant like 20 years ago or 15 years ago. And I think I liked the movie more than they did. I mean, it was just kind of fascinating that pigeons could be so instrumental in carrying messages for the war effort. And I mean, I was just totally, when I, when I decided to start to hunker down and write about that. I mean, I found all the research fascinating and just was super impressed. Well, Stephanie's knowledge, uh, sorry, novel is called Olive Bright Pigeoneer. And I'm telling you, you want to buy a copy of it, if for nothing else than to read the author notes. <laughs> <laughs> the book is great, but the, but the real draw, <laughs> the serious draw is the author note. It's absolutely fascinating. Are you planning on writing uh, more about this character, about Olive Bright? Yes, actually, um, I, my, the next book in the series is coming out in uh, January, and so Olive will be kind of moving forward with her, with her job with the intelligence organization, and there will be an author note. Nifty. Well, we'll have to talk then, because I really want to pursue this whole thing. <laughs> and how about you, Claire? Um, are you working on a, another book? I am. I'm working on the fourth in the series. Um, it's going to be... Um, the honeymoon of Stell and Lindy, my characters, and they're honeymooning in York. So they're going north. Great. York <laughs> is one of my favorite places. Years and years ago, when, back in the 80s, when I went to York, I, um, I did a lot of studying and I discovered that there was a ancient inn in the Bootham Bar Gate. And the Bootham Bar Gate is right next to York Minster. Mm -hmm. And the description was that if you took the room at the top, of the Booth and Bar Gate, whatever it was, and you lay there, you could, you would feel as though you were in medieval times because you would hear the bells of the minster and nothing else would disturb you. The flaw in that I discovered when I got there is there was no elevator. <laughs> so you had to drag all your luggage up. Like I don't remember how many flights of stairs. And additionally, one of my totally favorite memories is that York is full of these little narrow streets. Yes. some of which are one way for obvious reasons. Yeah. And I got there late on a Friday night when everybody is out hitting the pubs. So streets are full of drunken revelers and you can hardly make any progress. And I could not get to this hotel, no matter how hard I tried this, the map that I had, I could not find this hotel, a way to drive to it. And finally, in desperation, I thought, I know what I'll do. So I drove the wrong way up a one-way street 
And sure enough, a Bobby miraculously appeared, <laughs> you know, stormed over to the car, looked down at me ferociously. And, and I looked up at him and I said, I can't, I, here's my problem. You know, I said, I'm desperate. So I needed to attract your attention. I can't find this. And he looked at me for a moment. And then he said, shove over, love. He said, I'll drive you there. And he got into the car and he had this huge hat and it was a little car. So he put the, car, the hat in my lap and, you know, <laughs> clashed the gears. And, and it turned out there was some weird little turn that if you didn't know it, you know, you'd never find it. And he, yeah. we arrived at the hotel and then he smiled at me and he said, I'd have to give you a ticket. He said, if you park the, the, the car here, because there's a, whatever he said, but there is a garage down there, a garage down there. And I'll give you two hours before I come back and make sure that you have. So I had to drag the luggage up all these flights of stairs. It was an exhausting experience, but, but I love York and you can walk That's around the it, walls right? and you can do everything. And do you know Candace Robb's wonderful mystery series set in medieval York? Mm -hmm. I, Owen Archer is um, as an aide to the Archbishop of York, and it's a really spectacular series. Do any, do all, any of you know it? Are you interested in medieval England? No? Yes, well. And I'm not familiar with it. Well, I can highly recommend it. R-O-B-B, -B, her first name is Candace, and she, she's a real historian, but she does a wonderful job navigating the politics of Richard III. I mean, sorry, Richard II. Um, and the Neville in York, which is wonderful. So you'll have a good time there. Diane, you've already told us that um, that you are working on your fourth book, and then you apparently have a contract for five and six. So that's really good news. Um, and Diane, I was there when Diane won award for, was it best first novel or best historical novel at Left Coast Crime? It was first. Best first novel. Yeah, it was very exciting for all of us because after all, she lives in Scottsdale part time, so we have like a stake in Diane. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so it was wonderful to know that, uh, or to be there and to um, to witness that. So let me see if Pat, ah, there he is. Just perfect timing. There you are, PK. Hey, Do you how's have it going? Any comments or questions you'd like to forward from the audience? Absolutely. And audience, feel free to continue to ask your questions as you're going through. So. Uh, first of all, I've got to say that our audience here are big fans of all three of you. So that is really wonderful. Um, Emily Grindel Dame uh, said she loved all of Bright Pensioneer, and uh, she's excited because both Diane and Claire are new authors to her, and she can't wait to read your books. Um, so uh, congratulations, you're making some new fans here today. Um, Emily also wants to know if, for all three of you, do you normally travel to the location that you're going to be researching for a book? Um, I know this is a question specifically to England, but depending on where your books are set, do you actually travel there? You could do this alphabetically. It'd probably be easier to answer the questions that way. So, Diane, that puts you up first. It was my travel to, to England that kind of inspired it. Uh, that's where I, that Francis's house really is a house, and it really is where I say it is. And having seen that one time, just walking around London, kind of made me think, gosh, you know, I could put a character in that house, and, and I think that would work really well. Since then, I have not been able to, to go back and um, dying to, been trying for the past three years to get there. And that's going to be an issue because... Um, Marriage and murder is next. And I keep saying, they're not going to go on a honeymoon unless I can go somewhere. <laughs> so they can't go anywhere. I can't go anywhere. So we'll just have to see. But yeah, it, 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 I can't imagine writing about a place without having seen it, even though I see it now and not 1899. Do you guys agree? Yes. I have not <laughs> been oh. to, to, so imagine it. I have not gotten, had the pleasure of visiting um, Hertfordshire and, and the location, the Brickendenberry Manor. I would have loved to go, um, but I have not. I think probably if the whole COVID situation hadn't kind of derailed things, I probably would have been by now, but uh, I have I've not. I've only been to 
I've been to Scotland, Scotland one time many years ago, but never anywhere in England. So I'm actually really looking forward to the opportunity of, of going. And uh, I just did my best with all of the research materials available and thank heaven for the internet. There's really just a lot of information. Yeah. Um, I actually took two separate um, research trips specifically um, for my book. So um, the New Forest has a wonderful research library and historical, uh, I mean, a heritage museum that I just spent, you know, hours and hours and hours pouring over very local material that you can only find there. And, um, but yeah, I, I've been very lucky to, to be able to take two separate trips to just research my series. Yeah, I can't imagine doing it without have, having actually walked and been there, yeah. Well, COVID's been very hard on a lot of authors. We talked to Deborah Crombie the other night, and she's really suffering from not going back to England to research her um, Duncan Kincaid and Gemma James series. And uh, Charles Todd, who was two people, um, are having the same problem that they're so used to being able to go and travel and visit. So it's hard to say, you know, um, what the ripple on effect, how long it will be before travel feels safe or even possible and um, what authors are going to have to do to get around it. Anyway, PK, carry on. Actually, I, I have a, I'm rather curious. So when do you know that your research is done? Because you could re research probably till the cows come home, right? Sure. <laughs> yeah, you probably only use about 10% of what you actually uncover. And that's definitely part of the, you know, the work is just to figure out, okay, this is too much and, oh, I need a little bit more here. So it, it's a, definitely a nuanced thing to, to do, yeah. You can spend a lot more time than you really have, you know, going down these rabbit holes. And so I guess basically the research is done when the deadline is looming. Yep. You know you have everything you need. <laughs> it's just really interesting. So I think that might, might be it when uh, the deadline's looming and you, you've got to finish this. So I, I have a question, which is, you know, do you do you, you obviously do some research and travel to spark off the idea, but when you write, you can also, I'm speaking of an author well known to me whose process this is, writes along and then there will be like a parentheses and asterisk, look this up or figure this out or something. And you know, there's there's general research to spark you, but then there's specific research if you need to know a fact. And if you stop every time you need the specific thing, you might lose the flow of the writing. So which do you find works better for you to do as much as you can ahead of time or to do some and then go back when you've got the whole story written out and fill in the stuff that you need to know? I do enough ahead of time to get the plot. My first drafts are always just plot and dialogue. They're, they're very short. They're very kind of skimpy. And um, alongside in the margin is everything I need to look up to, to make this right. You know, I'll, I'll be writing something and think, how do I know that? Is that true? Oh, do I know this? Or do I just think this, you know? so. There's constant notes of, of things that I have to look up. So usually between draft one and two is when I do most of my research. Okay, how about you, Stephanie? I am like the exact opposite. I cannot, something about how my brain works, I cannot, I've tried actually many times to write down, okay, go look this up. It's just, it just is like ticking in the back of my mind that I have this blank spot in my manuscript that says insert native plant here. And I, I just can't, I have to just go and look it up. And I do write pretty clean first drafts. There's sometimes like plot holes or things that need to be fixed. But when I'm done with the first draft, I'm pretty, it's pretty solid. So I'm basically the exact opposite. <laughs> I'm, I'm like Diane, oh, I point over there. I'm like Diane, um, my first draft has all kinds of um, parentheses that says, look up, look up, describe, disc you know, the, the, and those are just kind of placeholders for me to go back to, because I do a lot of the research ahead of time and, and, and sometimes I don't even know what I have. I've just kind of like photocopied things that I know I might need. And 
Um, so I do that quick first draft and then it's that second draft where I go back through my research. And then, like you said, sometimes you have to, you realize you don't have what you need and then you have to do some more research. So it never quite ends until the deadline. So yeah. I think of my very dear and now departed friend, Sharon K. Penman, an author who I thought was brilliant and whom I really loved. And she wrote a lot of medieval stuff, but she was one who would say, you should never say they sat under a tree. You always had to say they sat under a beach or they sat under an oak or, you know, um, she felt that specificity made the book more, more alive, you know, more real that you should avoid generalization if you could. In other words, you wouldn't leap on a horse necessarily. It would be a roan or it would be, you know, um, pinto, well, not a pinto, that's Western, black oh. static or whatever, you know. <laughs> Um, and so if you do that, it would seem to me that you might have to adopt the parentheses method um, just to make sure that, for example, did a beech tree really grow in, you know, 11th century England, anywhere Eleanor of Aquitaine might have actually been. But, you know, there we are. It took her forever to write her books. So maybe maybe that wasn't the best um, approach, <laughs> but... Um, but she certainly did write amazing, amazing books and you could learn so much from them. Sorry, PK, I keep waxing in, carry on. No, no, um, Betty Glover was curious. She said, did your research for one book provide new ideas for a different book than the one you're currently writing? Mm -hmm. I don't think it did, oh, sorry. No, no, go ahead, I, I, don't, I don't know if I can, if I've run into that, if you have, Stephanie, yeah. Yes, I, I, I guess I run across different, different operations or missions that were done in intelligence or, or whatever during the war or, or different, um, just I'm really um, interested in all the, the little details that never come out actually in the normal history books or the normal articles or stories that are told about the war. So if I find some little, um, little bit of information that kind of piques my interest or curiosity, then if I can't use it in a current book, then I kind of put it away or tuck it away for um, use in, in the next book. And, and that has happened several times. So, I mean, there's just, I feel like I've spent so many hours researching World War II and I barely scratched the surface. So that's, I mean, super fun and uh, I, good to know that there's plenty of material. I actually had a um, very specific incidence where when I was researching the first book, I came across a real person. Um, his name was Henry Busher Mills, and he was a snake catcher is what they called him. <clears throat> Excuse me. And he actually mysteriously died at the very time that my second book was going to take place. And I thought, how can I not include a snake catcher in my second book when the timing is perfect? And his death was mysterious. So... Yeah, that definitely. <laughs> um, there's one other question that I have from the audience, and this is in regards to um, titles and covers. Uh, some, some books have very similar uh, titles, like somebody had a very similar title to one of your books this year, Diane. Um, so do you guys have any say in what those titles are, the cover art, anything like that in terms of the publishing process? Yeah, we're we're all Kensington, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, definitely. I, I I do. They they ask. They've almost always have used my titles. Any title? Have you guys ever had titles changed on you? I had one that they wanted me to tweak, but I just had to add, you know, a little bit. But no, other than that, no. Yeah, and then covers. Um, I'm asked to submit every idea I can think of. And um, they usually use some sort of conglomeration of that. Um, the only time I, I asked them to change it was they literally had the period wrong. And um, that was cover two. I'm, I'm like, this, this just looks so 1950s. You guys have to change <laughs> what they're wearing and, and things of that. But, but otherwise, yeah, I've been I, I feel like I'm really lucky with my cover artist. She really gets the idea of it. And I love your covers, Clara. Yeah, yeah me too. <laughs> me too. This is Diane's cover. So you can see um, 
the right. what she's talking about with the period costume. And I don't have Claire's book, but she's showing you also. Stephanie? Yes, I have mine. Yep. So yours does have, you know, there's there's a very World War II look um, that I have found. Oh. And that one fits it very nicely. But I will also tell you, ladies, that Kensington is unusual in this because in point of fact, um, with many publishers, um, the cover art is strictly up to the publisher, although the author gets to look at it and can have input. And titles are generally decided by the sales department and very often are not kept. Um, I, we've had many a discussion, haven't we, PK, with authors about the various title evolutions that right. um, have occurred. In fact, we were talking to Megan Abbott about the turnout the other night, and, um, and that was a title that took a long time to, to come to. I sometimes get um, catalog copy and so forth for books, and it will say, Untitled David Baldacci November, because that means the sales department and, and David have not come up with um, a title. But I think Kensington um, maybe more, um, maybe works with its authors a little more than some other publishers. It's smaller and therefore uh, more nimble. Uh, you know, it's just one of those things. Did you find that true this morning, PK? Because we had a group of Kensington Cozy authors this morning. It um, seemed like they had a lot more say and a lot more, um, it seems like Kensington tends to work closer with their authors. Yeah. Um, and, and they do, I think they do some really nice work with their cover art. So that's always nice to see. I like seeing the, the going back to the traditional hand painted covers and things like that, rather than just a, a Photoshopped you know, picture in general. Yeah. I always think it adds something to the book. So, um, and it's unusual because I think we've all had, I know I've had that conversation with plenty of a sci-fi writer who said, yeah, I didn't choose the title of the book or, you know, they got the cover completely, you know, we ask, you know, the cover doesn't seem to match the book at all. And it's because they, you know, a marketing department or marketing person chose it versus, um, the author, and they had no input. So. And you might also notice that very often the hardcover um, cover art is different than the paperback cover art. I was looking up a book today, a debut by Rose Carlyle, a New Zealand author, which I really liked, and she and I spoke, and she wanted me to look up something. And when I did, I saw the paperback cover, which bore no relationship at all to the hardcover so there's a different feeling in oftentimes in publishing about what makes a paperback cover. But I think I think Kensington sticks to the same design. I can't remember. It seems to me, Diane, that your paperbacks look just like your like your hardcovers, right? They do. Um, the audio book covers are even the same. Just the large print is um, a subrights thing. So another yeah. publisher actually does that. They have a different cover. And it's also interesting, we talked to a Swedish author on Thursday, and it was it's her first book translated into the US. And her Swedish cover was so different than the US cover. You know, she held it up and we held ours up and we and we talked about it. So there are different sensibilities in different countries. You know, for oftentimes if I if we have an author that has a British edition and an American edition, um, we can see there are real differences. So, you know, and how, how the books look. And sometimes the titles change, more often it's the covers. But, you know, it's fascinating to, to uh, and, and I, I never am entirely clear on what basis all this occurs. They say it's data, but I'm not at all sure that's true. I'm, I'm skeptical about data. <laughs> <laughs> all right, anything else, PK? Uh, you know, just one very curious reader is curious what everybody is reading right now that they're loving. Oh, great. Um, hmm. Reading nonfiction, I don't know. And Stephanie might like this, um, Last Hope Island. Oh, I've heard of that actually, but I've not read it yet. Everything she writes, I love. And she writes a lot about World War II. And uh, this is really interesting how basically as um, the other countries in Europe uh, kept trying to, to or were conquered by Germany, their governments fled to England and were formed anew to kind of combat together. So they all ended up in, in Britain at Last Hope Island. 
Who's the author, Diane? Lynn Olson. Lynn also, Olson? Yeah, she also wrote Citizens of London. And um, gosh, another one uh, about World War II in the US, those something days, I can't remember. But uh, she, she's really, I, I love nonfiction and, and she's really one of my favorite nonfiction authors. Great. How about you, Stephanie? What are you reading? I am actually reading Evil Under the Sun by Agatha Christie. I'm pretty sure I read it years ago, but uh, as to, uh, something I was reading recently uh, re referenced it and I realized I didn't, I didn't remember it. And so I've gone back and I always love to pick up an Agatha Christie. It's hard to go wrong. Right. How about you, Claire? Um, I'm working my way through Ruth Downey's Medicus series, which is a um, wonderful kind of murder. Well, yeah, murder mysteries kind of historical fiction set in Roman Britain. And I, oh. I'm a huge fan. I think I, I can't always remember the titles because they're in Latin, but I think I'm up to book seven in the series. And just I tell everyone I know, if you like historical mysteries, you like historical fiction, Fine Medicus and Ruth Downey, they're, they're fabulous. Talk about historical accuracy and authenticity and just, oh, you feel like you're there. It's just, it's fabulous. Okay. And she had one second more. Downey, right. Ruth it's, Downey. Yep, is D-O-W-N-I-E. Medicus is a Roman word for physician. Doctor, and he right. is in fact a doctor. And if I remember, cause I've read the multi, isn't it set around bath? I think it's Roman it's, bath. They he move they move all around. They even go to his okay. homeland in Gaul, and one isn't set in York. And I just one was set up in Hadrian's Wall, and okay. yeah, they're all kind of they're all over the place. So yeah, it's a very good series. Some of you may have read Lindsay Davis's wonderful Roman mysteries as well, but Medicus is is different. Anyway, um, that's a nice way to end it. So, ladies, thank you very much for spending time with us this afternoon. And I want to thank all of you who joined us. Um, if you know people who'd be interested in this, the Facebook video is going to live forever on our website. And there will be a podcast available for anybody who wants to download it probably tomorrow. So thank you so much for your participation. Let me wish you a great Saturday night. Bye, thank everybody. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye.